Okay, so this is part two of the endangered species lecture. And we're just gonna pick up right where we left off uh, in class. So I'm gonna review a, a, a tiny bit of just to make sure we're all on the same page. So as I talked about 1956, when it comes to what led eventually to the Endangered Species Act, 1956 was kind of the big year. Um, two people that year uh, both had epiphanies and, and did things that set off what we could call the, the extinction crisis. Of course, we've had five major extinctions on the planet over the millions of years or billions of years of the planet's age. Uh, some people have argued uh, in the last few decades that we might be in the sixth major extinction. Like we may just be starting. Again, as I've tried to be clear uh, throughout the semester, even though I do identify as an environmentalist, uh, we, we have to be data-driven. First off, we're historians. <laughs> uh, we can't predict the future, but at the same time, we always have to be data-driven and emotion always plays a role when you get into these things. So, But, but there is a lot of fears of, that that could be the case. And the fears that we might be in the sixth major extinction and it's not that bad, at the very least, a period of a lot of extinctions, like at the end of the Ice Age, we see a lot of extinctions, even though that wasn't a, a global extinction necessarily. Uh, for whatever reason, there is some real fears. It, 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 people you know, do refer to it as a crisis now. So again, Frank Preston, the biologist, was uh, the first uh, who came up with the idea of the SAC, the species area curve. In other words, the larger uh, an area we, we're talking about we're talking ecosystems here, the larger the area, not only do you get more individual animals, but you'll get more species. So we're really talking about biodiversity here. Um, and again, several people tested this, like David, uh, excuse me, Daniel Simberloff, and proved that yes, it, it, size in this case does matter. Anyway, so that is the first. And I think where the, the slide where we actually left off was looking at what might be called the blacklist. And that is the list of species who have, who have gone extinct. And um, I'll, I'll talk about this group in a moment, but there is a, a group whose acronym is IUCN, which is an international group that does indeed look at uh, animals that are going extinct and what we can do to stop it. And they do kind of keep the official list of animals that have gone extinct, at least since, in their case, they start with 1600, although most of the time, uh, at least in North America, we usually start with 1500. And the reason 1500 is always the year, like for exotics, is because again, that's the Columbian Exchange. That's when everything, uh, globally speaking, everything changed because all the old world, the new world, animals and plants and species all kind of came together and began to mesh. Um, although some people say, well, it took a hundred years for the real effects of that to get through. Anyway, um, they start with 1600. And, and this is what they say that they can prove or with data uh, have gone extinct. There's probably plenty of micro, microscopic organisms and insects that we'll never know about, but, but as far as what they can prove, 654 plants, 364 invertebrates, 103 birds, 63 mammals, 33 fish, 20 reptiles. And by the way, this, could, this changes all the time. So this is uh, what, when I captured it, these were the general numbers. Um, and you know, usually once an animal is, is spotted or, or you know, evidence of the animal, um, then if there's no more evidence for 50 years or more, at that point, they begin, you know, they, they, they look for these animals, and then at that point, they say, okay, this animal is now extinct, it's gone now. Um, I think what strikes you about this list, especially if, if you've kept up with environmental issues over the years, is the fact, I'm going to make some noise with the mic, sorry, I'm going to have to do so, so I apologize in advance if I, uh, if, if I just... Uh, made a lot of scratching noise. Okay, um, but, but if anybody keeps up with the environmental issues, you might go, well, that's nowhere near as many species, I think, as some of us thought. I mean, I still think it's shocking to think that each one of these species of plants and animals will never come back, as far as we know. Uh, but still, the number is much smaller because you do read accounts of, you know, a species a day going away or you know, hundreds of species every year, and this doesn't seem to add up to that. Probably um, the most famous example in the 20th century um, 
in, in, in fact, actually, I'm recording this in uh, November of 2021. And in fact, it was September of 2021 where this species officially was considered extinct. And that's the ivory-billed woodpecker. So I'm in North Florida right now. Obviously, most of you are in Southwest Georgia. This would have been a bird that would have been very common in both of these areas. Um, I, the, I've seen um, at the American Museum of Natural History and actually at the London Museum of Natural History. In both of those, they have um, stuffed versions of these. And both of them came from Lake City, Florida, uh, both of those examples. So North Florida, South Georgia would have been primary for ivory bill woodpecker, which was the largest woodpecker uh, of recent human times. And it was already beginning to become low in numbers in 1930s. There are some recordings of them, so we do know still what it sounded like. Um, and, but people already said this thing is becoming quite rare. There's some photographs of, of, of them in the 1950s. And then pretty much nothing. There's always been rumors that people have seen them around, um, but no real data. And in fact, when I was taking uh, a version of this class as a grad student uh, with a guy named Dr. Frederick Davis at FSU, and he was a big birder. I remember that fall, there was a recording that came out and a couple of vague photographs where in, I believe, Arkansas, some people and people who knew what they were doing think they may have seen an ivory billed woodpecker. It was a huge deal. 60 Minutes did a story on it. It's a bird back. Uh, but the more they investigated, uh, the more they, they really came to the conclusion that it wasn't there. Uh, and this year they did officially, and that's been 15 years ago now, this year they did indeed officially declare it extinct, even though it's really been considered extinct for decades now. Uh, in fact, I didn't realize that it wasn't officially considered extinct, but it is officially now. Um, okay, so, so there's one piece of this. The other thing in uh, 1956 was another biologist, uh, a, a biologist named Ray Erickson. And one of the things that, that and he wasn't the only one, but, but he was very involved with the efforts to save the whooping crane. And this year, the, the, the alarm was raised. There was a, a, you know, scientists got together and they realized that literally they were, uh, as, as far as they could tell, there were only 24 whooping cranes left at that point. Which again, as a kid growing up, I can remember, you know, the whooping cranes would go over and I can remember my grandparents stopping and looking and, you know, hey, the cranes, look. And I remember being like, eh, they're cool, big birds. I never realized until I got much older why that was such a big deal. Just like when I was a kid, uh, uh, you know, in the 70s, if somebody saw a bald eagle, I mean, it, it, it went into the newspaper. People would call up and say, hey, I just saw a bald eagle. Um, nowadays, it's no big deal to see a bald eagle because, because they're plentiful today. Same thing here. You do see whooping cranes today. But at this time, you know, 1950s, that pretty much people thought this is going to be the next ivory rebuild woodpecker. Um, there was a huge campaign, and uh, Eric, Dr. Erickson led uh, much of this. There was a huge campaign to do something about the whooping crane. And, you know, in 1958, there was a, a, a U.S. stamp. In fact, there's a whole set of, of endangered animals, and, and the whooping crane was on one of them. Uh, National Geographic, and I'll mention National Geographic again a little bit later at this lecture. Um, for those, which is most of you, those of you who are you know, born in the late 90s or early 2000s, I, I think it's hard for, for people of, of, of your age to really understand how big of a deal National Geographic used to be. From the, Even though it goes way far back, but really from about the 1930s, and in particular, I think the 50s up through the 80s, it was a, an incredibly influential magazine. It's still around today, but that, you know, you could buy it in Winn-Dixie today. It used to be you could only get it either at a library or you had to subscribe to it. And it was one of these magazines that was actually rather, um, you can't see any lines. I thought I had one on me, but in fact, I brought one to class and then I never did pull it out. Um, I don't have it. But I'm sure you've seen them. They're almost like little books. I mean, they're bound. They're, they're very much meant to last, unlike most magazines. And no one ever got rid of them. So when you had them, you, you, they'd be on your shelf. I remember almost every house I go to, they, you'd have the yellow shelf of National Geographic. Um, again, nowadays, they're just uh, like a TV channel. People don't, you know, they're, they're more ephemeral today. Uh, and they also used to do a series of specials in the 60s and 70s in particular. But if they did an article on, say, a particular animal, it, 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 it really changed things. And in 1959, they, 
ran an article, and you can barely see it, sorry, it's a bad scan, but it says, Whooping Cranes Fight for Survival was the name of the article. And again, this helped change minds. And again, basically, whooping cranes do migrate. Um, so um, you're not just talking about one area. You're, I mean, you talk about SAC, you're talking about a large area that you need to make sure they have access. And, um, and so lots of things were done to try to increase their populations. I mean, they, you may have seen the movie. There's been movies, I think Jeff Daniels is in the movie where a person basically with a, a little self-propelled plane and if they guide whooping cranes to their mig migratory areas, um, they would get, you know, if they had a hatchling with no parents or something, they'd use a puppet to feed the bird. You know, they would do anything impossible to maintain the species. And it was considered a success story. But again, in the conversation in the 50s about whooping cranes, you know, again, the alarm first raised in 1956 by Erickson, um, really began to change a lot of minds about species and, and saving species. The IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, which initially, it's an international group, which was initially founded in France. Today, it's headquartered in London in the UK. Um, they eventually created what they called the Red List, as in like danger, right? The, you know, the Red List was a list of species that need to be looked at, you know, need to be preserved. This is really the first of these lists. Uh, Ericsson was very involved in this. The whooping crane was on that list. Uh, so this idea of, of, of identifying the problem, it's almost like, you know, if you have a problem, they always said the first thing to do is admit you have a problem and then deal with it. That was sort of like society going, we admit we have a problem. And, you know, every organization does these slightly differently, but, but you know, there's threatened, there's endangered, unfortunately, there's extinct. But there's also, you know, least concern, like one day we can deal with this, but it's not a major problem yet. So these are some of the categories that they use. Um, and this is a, taken from the website it, not, just the other day, so this is in 2021, looking at um, which species uh, are out there that, that are you know, very much in danger. And again, they tend to have much more conservative numbers, and yet the numbers are really quite shocking you know, when you really start thinking about it. And this is why people really do think that we might be on the sixth extinction, even with the exaggerations taken care of, if you kind of push the exaggerations to the side, there is this real fear that this could be the future. Um, the whipping crane issue, the SAC awareness, uh, the IUCN's red list, uh, of course, Silent Spring. You know, all these things begin to come together to, to make a lot of Americans more willing to be more proactive and, and maybe take slightly more drastic measures than just hunting license and, and, and things like that they did in the sort of progressive era. Let's go a little further. Um, so again, this is Erickson. That's why, that's why I said, you know, 1956 is kind of the year because you had these two scientists both, you know, sounding the alarm one way or the other. So that 1966 is the first Endangered Species Act. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't super strong, but, but it got the whole process going. This is a federal law. And the main thing that it did it did a couple of things, but the main thing that it did, and the most la lasting thing, was that it basically created uh, the U.S. version of the Red List. Um, the, it, through the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Agency, uh, they would create a list of endangered and threatened species. So um, the very first official list, March 11th, 1967, but, but there was a 65 list and earlier, so even before the law was passed, people are already working on this, but this is the official list, 1967, uh, 75 species altogether. Uh, some of the ones, again, of course, I'm a Floridian, so uh, if Florida led the way, we had more, Florida had more animals on this list than any other one state. Florida, as I said before, Florida has always been kind of, unfortunately, the, um, I'm gonna have to change a battery in a moment for the light that's, that I have going here. So I'll get my battery ready for me. So the lights will go out in a moment. I'm gonna to try to get them back on. Of course, it doesn't matter. You don't need to see me, but still. Um, but Florida has always sadly been kind of the sort of the, the focal point for a lot of endangered species. Um, so alligator, the American alligator, the bald eagle, the whooping crane, ivory billed woodpecker, which of course by that point, it really was essentially extinct already. But uh, the grizzly bear, the, the, the Florida manatee, uh, the Florida key deer, which is a small version of a deer that lives in the Florida Keys, the Florida panther, 
um, and many other species, but, but these are the big ones. These are the ones that, that, that people really kind of latched onto. Uh, the, these are those emotional animals, if you will. So in addition to creating the list, it also, you know, which really the big picture is not that much money, but still it, 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 it provided funds to buy land. Again, remember SAC, we don't want just a little bit of land, we need lots of land. If we're gonna really preserve these species, we need, we need to really buy ecosystems. So 15 million initially for habitat preservation, in other words, buying land by the federal government and encouraging states and community counties to do the same thing. The very first land bought for this specific, again, the idea of buying land for the sole purpose of preserving species was the National Key Deer Preserve in South Florida. This was the very first one bought under this. Later, you get things like Big Cypress Swamp, which, you know, extended the size of the Everglades, and there's plenty more out there. Okie Finoki, some of that was purchased under this, but this was the very first one, 2,300 acres, which in the big picture is not that big, actually. Uh, but again, this is, but this is huge. I mean, they're, they really are looking at not just buying 50 acres, not just 100 acres, but looking at thousands, and later tens of thousands of acres to preserve. Um, some of these, you know, now looking back, I'll, I'll, this will come up a couple of times, um, sometimes looking back, there's some debate of, you know, did, was there an overreaction? For instance, the American alligator. Uh, alligators, of course, were hunted for meat, uh, in particular for their hide. I mean, you know, having alligator belts and boots and stuff was very common. Um, giving out baby alligators as gifts. I'll talk about that in the next lecture. Uh, wait, the last, very last lecture, because I'm going to do exotics as a separate lecture. Um, short, but separate. Uh, we'll talk about that more later. But the idea of alligators were very commodified very much commodified. And it's always weird for me because I grew up in the 70s and 80s and that was when alligators were protected. Nowadays, you can, you know, get people can hunt alligators. You can still find alligator products. You, you can eat alligators at restaurants. But I grew up where that wasn't the case. So they were on the list. They were protected. And that's what that means. And once they're on the list, they're protected. Federal funding uh, has to go in, you know, if there's federal funding, you can't do anything but hurt these animals. Anyway, um, Almost immediately, once the alligator was put on the list, which stopped hunting um, and again, efforts to preserve them, the numbers bounced back almost immediately to the point that, you know, just, you know, 50 years later, uh, alligators are almost a nuisance in some places. Now, some of that is because we've gone into their territory as we've expanded. But nonetheless, some people have thought maybe they really weren't in danger, just maybe the data was bad. I've even heard a conspiracy theory, which I don't believe, but I've heard a conspiracy theory that they were purposely put on the list so that they could easily be taken off the list and an early success story. I don't believe that, but I have heard that. Uh, but there has been a lot of concern that maybe they, that, that this one was a little too radical. And it has turned some people away from it. Like, was that, you know, did they need to be on the list? Uh, but again, I grew up in the 70s and 80s and definitely people were all about protecting alligators, especially in Florida. Um, okay, so... One thing that begins, so we got that legislation, which is fairly popular. Um, at the same time, in the late 60s, post Silent Spring um, and, and into the early 70s, there was a lot of a lot of presence in the media, whether we're talking about uh, TV shows or movies, but also the news, documentaries, National Geographic newspapers, focusing on marine animals mostly mammals. So for instance, and this is a show that was filmed down in Florida, uh, a show called Flipper. Uh, it was a movie and then later was a TV series um, where you know you have this uh, basically anthropomorphized version of a dolphin. It was kind of like Lassie, but a dolphin. Uh, there's my light. I knew it was going to go out. I'm going to try to switch my battery. Uh, we'll see. Uh, if this better, it may not. I don't know if it's work either. All right, I should hit pause, shouldn't I? Should be wasting time trying to get my light on. I don't think that's gonna work. I think I'm just gonna be in the dark. Okay, you don't need to see me. Um, so you got that, uh, another, another National Geographic article, this one from 1969. Uh, the, the, the cover is all about Ireland, but uh, the, the, the big article in it, and it's still, um, this is the one I actually brought the class uh, on Tuesday, uh, the article by Dan Hartman, a biologist, uh, Florida's manatees, mermaids, and peril. And it called, you know, there's always been a rumor that uh, maybe 
the idea of mermaids may have come from people seeing man manatees at a distance and somehow thinking that was a mermaid. I've, I've always been skeptical if that's true or not, but that's always been the rumor. Um, again, this one article um, almost overnight changed attitudes about manatees, um, a creature that most people didn't even know existed outside of Florida and some of the Gulf Coast. All, th this magazine article led to Jacques Cousteau doing a, a documentary of, of manatees and another documentary series, and both of those played in prime time, I think in 1970. So within a year or two of this article, manatees became a huge focus. They became one of the icons of endangered species, again, a marine mammal in this case. Um, and again, today everybody knows manatees, and I, I, you know, and we talked a little bit about them the other day. Um, as most of you know, if you've ever seen one, most of the time they do have scarring. This was the case in the '60s, and it's the case in the 2020s now. And some of these can be quite severe. In fact, uh, Dan Hartman he talks about this in the article, and this is still done today, often to identify the different manatees that they use scars, and they have these scar charts. Um, to identify the various manatees. So it's helpful for biologists, but it's a very sad comment on the lives of manatees, in other words. I think the most notorious uh, campaign in this period, and um, I do have, uh, I'm going to upload on Georgia View a version of this, uh, but this was the baby seal ad uh, that came out in the early 70s. The one I'm going to show you, I think comes from 1980. It's a much later version of it. Uh, as some of you may know, um, seals, when, uh, some seals, when they're babies, they do have this, uh, this very soft white fur. And, you know, obviously it does make for nice coats and nice clothing and blankets. And so, you, you know, you want to um, get them when they're young and so you can get this fur. And, you know, you don't want to blow them with a rifle that's going to ruin all the fur. So one of the, the ways they used to do this um, would be clubbering you club them and uh, that's what people would do and um there was an an ad uh, i should say a public service announcement where you basically saw a baby seal looking at the camera and uh, down came the club the one i'm going to upload doesn't show that it, it shows it almost happening but it doesn't actually show the moment of it happening and um, you may have heard, you know, sometimes we talk about somebody being cruel. You say, oh, there must be, there's somebody so mean, they go club a baby seal or something like that. I mean, this became kind of the, the, um, the iconic or the, 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 the case, case the, the, the case example of cruelty to animals, right? Um, one thing, I, this has always freaked me out. Um, there's an older article talking about one of the ways they would catch seals Hunt, seal hunters, they would put salt on the ice and then seals would come up and they lick the salt and then their tongues would get stuck. And then, so they scream and that's how you find them because they're, you look for seals with their tongue stuck on the ice. Anyway, um, that was uh, a very, again, notorious public uh, ad. And then of course, you know, not only dolphins, but the orcas, we, you guys have watched Blackfish already. And so, you know, the debates over over orcas but this is you know this is a period sea world was in places like sea world like marine land were huge uh everybody knew shamu i remember i went to san diego as a little kid in 79 and i remember i still have it like my son has it you know i got a stuffed animal of, of, of shamu and uh, so you know whales were i you know were, were loved orcas dolphins manatees seals um sea turtles uh, there was a real connection, and but again, in particular, was marine mammals. So, Congress passed uh, a, a pretty tough bill, the the Marine U.S. Marine Mammals Protection Act, uh, in December 1972, which basically, you know, very strong efforts to preserve and protect whales, dolphins, uh, all kinds of whales, dolphins, manatees. Um, seals, uh, especially on the West Coast. And it was extremely popular, this act, you know, and still uh, to this day when you ask people, it's like, yeah, of course, protect dolphins and whales and manatees. So it was incredibly popular. And this is, you know, um, you know, we're talking 10 years after Science Spring, but but this is only a couple of years after Earth Day. This is, you know, this is right in the heart of the environmental movement. So even politically, this is very popular. And of course, that's going to lead the way for more protections. 
Um, it was a few years before anybody gets prosecuted under this. Actually, in Florida, 1977, a, a person uh, admits to shooting a porpoise and eventually is arrested for it and eventually is convicted for it. And so this is the very first case. Uh, you know, so in other words, it shows the government really will convict people under this law. Um, and of course, uh, one of the things about that case is uh, there was a huge outcry when, when, when the case was first announced. Did you know somebody shot a porpoise? And again, by that point, I know in class I told you the story of how, um, there, in fact, there's been several stories. I, I, I uncovered a story in the late 30s in Florida where a whale got trapped near St. Augustine and people just went crazy shooting it. And there's, unfortunately, there are stories all over North America of, of very similar things, it was outright cruelty to the animals. By the 70s, you didn't, when it did happen, people were appalled at it. So you can see how quickly attitudes changed. The, the Marine Mammals Act and, and some other acts really, you know, kind of was the preamble to the big one, the 1973 Endangered Species Act. Now it has been amended and updated since then, but this is really when people talk about the Endangered Species Act, this is really what they're referring to. This is the big one. Um, again, about a year, almost exactly a year after the Marine Mammals Act, everybody voted for this. All, all 100 senators voted for it, and all the House members except for voted for it. It was that popular. Um, and again, as, as some of the language says, it is to protect the endangered wildlife, quote, insofar as it's practical and consistent with their primary purpose. Now, in other words, for the agencies, the primary purpose of the agencies that are gonna be doing this protection. And you, some of you are really into political science. All of you have, have taken political science. You know that, and, and I don't think this is the official term, but there are what I call, and many of us call weasel words. Everybody knows what a weasel word is, even if you don't say that term. If you're a parent, you know what a weasel word is. If you're, like in my case, if my son, when he was little, come up to me and say, Dad, can we go to Disney World? And I would say, we might, because, and then a week later, if we didn't go, he said, you said we're going to, no, I said, we might. <laughs> so everybody knows a weasel word. A lot of laws have weasel words in them, um, you know, ways you can get out. But even with those types of words, this is a very strong bill. Before I talk a little more about this, this is, you know, this was signed into law and encouraged. Uh, he encouraged Congress to vote for it. That was Richard Nixon, a Republican president. Uh, as we know, and again, I know I'm being uh, uh, painting with a broad book brush here, but uh, environmental issues do tend to fall along political lines. I, you know, Democrats do tend to be a little more environmental, Republicans tend to be a little less, or maybe I should say liberals versus conservatives. Uh, that's not the case with everybody, of course. And that definitely wasn't the case in the past as much as it might be today. And in fact, the Endangered Species Act will play a role in that political split over the environment. But in the early 70s, um, this was not the case. And in fact, uh, Republicans and Democrats, both, uh, it really wasn't a partisan issue in the same way it might be today. And Richard Nixon, I mean, you know, Mr. Watergate, uh, you know, he's really not a conservative in a modern sense. He was not really part of the conservative movement in the same way Reagan was. Uh, but he definitely was on the right. And, and so I think a lot of people were surprised to hear that Nixon uh, might have been an environmentalist. I don't know if we can call him actually an environmentalist at heart, but then again, who cares? <laughs> you know, I don't really care what a politician thinks. As long, long as they do something I want them to do, I'm happy. Um, and so it really is quite surprising when you look at, and this is just some of the laws, the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, the Endangered Species Act, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, even things like OSHA, which is more about worker safety, but it has to do with environmental concerns. Um, this is really quite surprising, I think, for a lot of people. Uh, I think the story is not so much that he was necessarily an environmentalist, although it does show how mainstream these ideas were, but that they were politically popular. And, he, and this is one of the reasons he gets reelected in 72 was passing some of these laws. Um, although there is a, a secret weapon here. Um, somebody that, that has not really gotten a lot of notice except for amongst Flor Florida historians and amongst environmental historians. And that's a guy named Nathaniel Reed. He originally was from Florida and he worked for a governor named Claude Kirk, who also very similar to Nixon, a Republic, first Republican governor in Florida since the Civil War. Um, and he, or excuse me, since Reconstruction. 
and was not environmental as a heart, but Nathaniel Reed worked for him and pushed him in that direction. Then Nathaniel Reed worked for Richard Nixon. And again, he was the one pushing a lot of this. Again, he has, a, I think, a very minor Wikipedia page. He did write a, a, an autobiography about his life, but he would be, you know, I know I'm always doing this, but he would make an interesting biography for some of you. A good capstone would be looking at some of his policies um, because, again, he hasn't really been dealt with a whole lot. And he's a big player in this time period in, the, in environmental politics. And there has been, however, there have been several books uh, and articles written on Nixon's role in the environment. And uh, it's, again, it's part of the rewriting of the history of Nixon. Not so much that, um, you know, again, not to discount Watergate at all, but, but sometimes that, that becomes so much the focus. It's like, well, there are other things that happen when he was president that do matter. And this is a good example of that. Now, if you Google, which I was actually Googling image just to put images in this PowerPoint. In fact, the image of the bear, you'll see in a moment. Um, but, but so I just, I just did a screenshot of just a Google image search when you type in endangered species. And again, you can immediately see what we think of when we think of this, you know, the bald eagle, whales, uh, you know, beautiful landscapes out west, grizzly bears, you know, uh, polar bears. This is what people think of when they think of the Endangered Species Act. Uh, again, very popular act, even though we'll talk in a moment that there are some pushes to change it some. Um, but nonetheless, this is still very popular. It's just, it's a feel good law. And that's what Nixon referred to. This is feel good legislation. But it has a lot of unintended consequences. And that un one of those unintended consequences is what's going to help lead to the political split over the environment. Okay. So, and this is going to happen in 1978. So you have the Tennessee Valley Authorities, the TVA, which some of you might know about. This was created in 1933. This is part of the New Deal. This was a program and it gives a series of dams and, and other uh, environment, um, engineering uh, changes dealing with the Tennessee River and the River Valley to, to, in particular, to create electricity to electrify rural areas of Tennessee, a very poor area. And it was a, it's still around. It, it's a huge job creator. Um, it, it's beloved there by, by the folks. And they were just about to build a TVA in, in the 1970s. They were beginning to build a new dam that was going to run up around, I think, the final cost was $133 million. And they were just getting ready, almost done with the final, you know, they, they, they were close to being done. And of course, you have the Endangered Species Act. And this is a very strong act. Uh, much stronger than the 6-6 six, six version. And part of this is, you know, if you're going to do a federal project, you have to do an environmental assessment, in, in, in including making sure that this project does not harm or negatively impact any animals on that endangered species list, which we all think of as grizzly bears and polar bears and bald eagles and dolphins. Well, um, there was a biologist, uh, David Etmeer, uh, at the University of Tennessee. He is, uh, I think he's still around, but he was the expert on fish in Tennessee. In fact, he wrote a, a very major book on the fishes of the Tennessee River. And he went out, you know, during this project with, that's him in the front with his back to the camera, uh, with a couple of students, you know, and they, what you do, you know, you go out there and you net the water and you see what you find. And what did he find? Well, he found this fish. The snail darter, which is on the endangered species list. This is not what most Americans were thinking of, you know, even though it's a species that was endangered and it's important. And, you know, remember the NOAA principle? I mean, that's kind of, you know, it's a species that exists, it's endangered, and since it's endangered, we need to protect it. Um, so he raised the alarm. And environmental groups got involved. The government got involved. If we finish this dam, it very well may uh, endanger the survival of this fish. And again, there was a massive grassroots campaign to do this. This is, people were like, this is why we wanted this law to get passed. I guess I, I, I like this t-shirt. It's a save the snail darter and, and the, you know, you can almost can't see it, but you have the, uh, the if you've ever seen the, the poster for Jaws, and so the Jaws as the TVA, and of course, the little snail darter at the top instead of a woman swimming. 
there was a huge outcry on both sides of this issue. Obviously, people who were pro-environment said, this is why we have the law. This is it, you know. Um, on the flip side, most of those members of Congress, most of, of their constituents, even Richard Nixon, this was not what they had in mind. They were protecting grizzly bears and, you know, furry animals and manatees and animals that kind of live in areas where we're not going to be building too much. I mean, out in the ocean, out in swamps. Nobody was thinking, you know, insects. They weren't thinking snails, which uh, they were not thinking uh, mushrooms and toads and frogs, which are species that will have impacts later. We won't get into those, but this is this really surprised a lot of people. And for a lot of people, say, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, just thinking out loud, but you know, you're a working class farmer, you know, small farmer, and you're you're maybe looking for the TVA for a job and this is this damn project, pun intended, is you know gonna be your lifeline. And then you know a bunch of body, you know, college folks and some you know granola tree huggers tell you that you gotta protect this little tiny fish. And you can't, you know, you even though I would protect the fish, I would side on that, I think, but I understand that angle. And or you're you know you're a business owner and you're 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 trying to you know develop an area. A poor air and you're developing it. And again, this little fish is going to stop you from doing that. And this becomes a huge debate. So right off the bat, you have the Endangered Species Act Committee, um, which sometimes is nicknamed the God Squad. I'm going to come back to their others in a moment. The Endangered Species Committee or the ESA Committee, the God Squad. Uh, it's called that, I and mean, it's kind of a sarcastic name, but basically... You know, they, you know, when they have these conflicts, and this was one of the first times this came up, they were just found it. Um, they uh, basically are going to go, okay, which do we do we side with the species or do we go with the project? Again, they're playing God. They're going to decide maybe a species goes away, you know. So it's comprised of Secretary of Agriculture, Secretary of the Army, the Chair of the Economic, uh, Economic Advisors, Council of the Economic Advisors, the EPA Director, Secretary of the Interior, Director of the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration. And then the president will appoint for each case uh, somebody from the affected state. The president gets to appoint it. And then um, I think Secretary of the Interior also has to approve it. So this is what the committee is. It's, again, a seven person committee. They favored the fish. They said, look, this is why the, this is exactly why the law exists. This, you know, it's good data. We favor the fish. Supreme Court of the United States in a 6-3 decision also said it's constitutional. We passed it, it's constitutional law. This is the spirit of the law. This is the letter of the law. It should go. But Congress did have the right, I mean, this is part of the bill, they could exempt it. And again, there were a lot, I mean, this was a major political and public campaign. And, uh, but a lot of constituents were like, this is not what I had in mind, you, you know. And so ultimately Congress did exempt this project uh, from the ESA requirements and the dam was built, uh, finally, finally finished in late 1979. And this is really the moment that, that in many ways that the environmental movement really split. Um, and this is, you know, again, this is post Watergate, post Vietnam. There already was a lot of distrust of the government, especially on the left. And this just seemed to drive that home. Uh, but for, again, for, I don't want to just say Republicans, but for a lot of people in Congress and in government, they thought this is environmental uh, activism out of control. This is not the role of government. Uh, you know, we, we're not here to protect little fish, we're not here to protect snails or, or whatever, you know. Um, and partly it's, it's, it's issues like this that will lead, for instance, the 1980s, not the main reason, but it's one of the reasons why you will see something like the election of Ronald Reagan. Um, and Reagan didn't really campaign much on the environmental issues, but the, his administration, a lot of people he appointed, including who he appointed for Secretary of the Interior, um, very much had the attitude of uh, this stuff has gotten excessive. Government's gone too far, they're too activist, especially with environmental issues, this is affecting business, this is affecting jobs. And keep in mind, this is late 70s. This is a time of high inflation. This is a time of the energy crisis, higher unemployment. Uh, so again, fish or um, you know, jobs. And that, that was, but you can also go short-term goals versus long-term goals, right? Um, so again, the, the conservative 
um, resurgence in the 1980s can partly be uh, rooted in this, not only this, but this event as well. There has, you know, it is a significant moment in politics, significant moment in environmental history. So it has been written about quite a bit. These are some of the more famous, or I should say, more well known books uh, about this. And this is something that still comes up in politics today, the, you know, uh, many people wanting to either strengthen these laws, especially the dangerous species laws, but others wanting to, pun intended, gut the ESA. Uh, many people think that you know, because it protects all this land, which can't be developed, it seems to, for some people, it seems to prioritize animals over people. Um, if you're a business interest, and, and again, not to play political uh, games here, but you know, the previous president, Donald Trump, was very much, very, I mean, he was very pro-business, very anti-environment. I mean, he was upfront about it. And for him, the Endangered Species Act was a problem. He gave away more land that was in public hands than any other president ever has. Some of that has been taken back into public ownership, um, but nonetheless, uh, and for a lot of people, they thought too much, too much, too much. And this is where the data is important. This is why when people say, like in you know, a lot of newspaper articles, especially in the 80s, were saying, and Paul Ehrlich were saying, you know, million species by the year 2000, and then obviously that didn't happen, that gives fuel to people say, look, we overreacted. We didn't need to do all of that. And, and the nuance and the subtlety that we really need in these kinds of policies go out the window, right? Um, and again, one, one more thing. Um, I don't know if you guys remember a few years ago, there's people took, took control of, of, of some of the lands. They said, this is America's land. This should be the government controlling this. So, so it really since the snail darter campaign in that period, there has been a special out west because so much of land out west is publicly owned. There's a big backlash against the idea of publicly owned lands, which goes back to 1956 and the SAC, but it also goes back to people like Teddy Roosevelt and the, and the original preserves and such. But um, there is a real turn on this. And, and you know, anyway, uh, so a lot of people are wanting to modernize what they call modernize the Endangered Species Act. It definitely needs to be, uh, I think, you know, it always needs to be tweaked. But in some of these cases, it really is. Let's gut it. You know, let, let's let's make it just about the big pretty animals, and let's not make it all inclusive. Let's not make it the NOAA principle. In other words, it has had some successes. Um, you can see about sixteen hundred species are on the list today. That's quite a ways from the seventy five on the original red list. Um, that about almost forty species have been including the alligator, have been documented to be recovered. Some have gone extinct, 11, since it's been in there. And others, you know, put on there, then it's like, ah, maybe we didn't really need that. Um, uh, but again, it is a pretty long list today. So you can see that's going to have a huge impact on, um, on, on future decisions if that many species are on the list. And a lot of people want to make that a much smaller list and a much a much more of an advisory list, not a, a list that, that dictates political action. Okay, um, as you saw for a second there, uh, since, uh, since this is, you know, you guys were in class the other day, I, I talked about sea turtles in class. I'm gonna kind of redo that part, I'm gonna do it very quickly, because uh, I do wanna talk a little bit about sea turtles here at the end, and I know I did some of that in class. I'm not gonna repeat everything I talked about. And for anybody who wasn't here, you get a chance to hear some of that again. So again, you guys know, I, was, I always mentioned, I used to be a park ranger, that's me when I was much younger. And that was what it looked like when I was doing this. And I, I and later my future wife were working on uh, patrolling sea turtles, uh, a sea turtle nests. Uh, these are a couple of sea turtles, green turtles that my wife took a photo of at a rehab place in South Florida. So sea turtles, you know, even though they're not the mammals, but they have become Kind of, kind of interestingly, they, they're a reptile and they have become um, sort of the, one of the main, along with manatees and whales, kind of an icon of endangered species. And, you know, for instance, in Florida, I think Georgia has one too, but I know in Florida, in fact, that's, my wife has this on her car, um, you know, sea turtles, tags and things of that nature. And again, we just often just say sea turtles. There's actually many types of sea turtles. These are the, the uh, seven major types in the world. Uh, five of them uh, can be found in Florida, and four of them can be found in Georgia. Uh, the flatback, that's what I'm not as familiar with. That one's actually found in Australia. So these are the ones that are found in Florida. Uh, loggerhead, green turtle, weatherback, hawksbill, and Kemp's Ridley. The last two are, or actually the bottom three are very, very rare, especially the last two. Uh, these are photographs of them. And again, that's the leatherback in the top right, the largest turtle. 
um, when it's, it's just absolutely massive. Uh, this is the loggerhead. I think this is the one most people think about. Um, it was it was quite quite rare by the 1970s. Um, but the green sea turtle is the one we're going to talk a little bit about. That was the one that was the most commercial. That's the one that was uh, the most hunted. Um, and it's also a bit controversial, as you'll see in a moment. This is the leatherback. Sometimes old writings talk about it as a uh, chunk back, sometimes as it's referred to. Um, let me get my chair keeps moving. Sorry, I keep messing with my chair. Um, and it, it is absolutely massive. And these, are, these aren't even the largest varieties of them. Georgia has pretty much the same turtles, um, but again, mostly in Georgia, and several of you, which I was amazed by, several of you have actually seen sea turtles in the wild, but mostly on those barrier islands, because Georgia doesn't really get the beaches that Florida gets. You mostly just, have, you know, bear, barrier, I can't get the word out, can I? Barrier islands that start with Anastasia Island and St. Augustine and go up to the Carolinas, and you guys are, you know, because Georgia's coast is actually quite small. Um, it's covered with these barrier islands. So um, for the most part, that's where the sea turtles are landing in Georgia. And some of you talk about Tibby and St. Simons and Sapelo and such. Um, mostly loggerheads, a few green turtles, and the, the other two show up very, very occasionally. Um, in other parts, this is actually Kemp Ridley's in uh, Costa Rica. I think this is actually Costa Rica, but also Mexico. They do show up in huge numbers, even during the day. Uh, but there is some evidence that at one time, this would have been the case in Georgia and Florida. Um, that and it's early explorers talk about just seeing hundreds and hundreds every time they went to the beach. Uh, we don't see anywhere near those numbers today. Uh, as you guys know, some of you have seen this. If you want to find a sea turtle at night, um, you, you look for the tracks. They usually come up, the sand's wet. They, they, they move very slowly, a very distinctive track. Almost looks like a, a four-wheeler went through. Uh, the mother, of course, it's the females doing this. And they'll do this about two or three times in a, in a, in a season. season, egg laying seasons from April to September. Most of it happening in May and June. Uh, they come up, uh, they try to find dry sand. Uh, they, they, with their front, front flippers, uh, create this, you know, knock all the sand out to create this area. And then they use their back flippers to actually dig the hole. It's kind of a light bulb shape. Holes, so skinny at the top and then wide at the bottom and can lay anywhere from 30 to all the way up to you know 200 eggs but usually about 50 to 80 eggs seem to be pretty average they, they look like little ping pong kind of soft they, they they do breathe um and this is actually a tourist photo from the 1930s where it used to be you pay somebody and they take you out they dig up your eggs you can get as many eggs as you want get a nice photo of it uh but they are very vulnerable uh, they don't always hatch, you know, it could be temperature, it could be uh, in, inundated with water, um, sometimes it just gets too hot, too cold, they, they do wash away, they do get predated, that's actually, this is a photo I took when I was doing this, um, you can just see eggshells everywhere, you can see holes up there, this is where a raccoon and ghost crabs have gotten in, you can see all the tracks, and the seagulls we eat it, the ants eat it, um, but if they do hatch, um, after usually uh, almost 40 days, uh, they come up, usually at night, they come up through the sand, emerge, uh, it's known as an eruption. Um, I've never got to see that. I have seen a few, uh, I, when I patrol the beach, I, saw, I would actually see a few of them crawl into the ocean. I've never actually seen them come out of the sand. I've seen videos. And then they, they again, they crawl to the ocean. They swim as far out until the water gets deep, it gets cool, and then off they go. Um, and they, after they've tracked and they realize that they travel for thousands of miles, but they will come back to the original place where they were, where they were hatched. And again, they know this through tracking. They've been able to figure this out. Um, eggs were, you know, if, if you know what you're looking for, they're very easy to, to find. And people do dig these up even today. I mean, it's a federal crime. It's a state crime. It's usually also a local law crime. But it, it, they were highly desirable for cooking. Um, apparently, they're supposed to be an aphrodisiac. Oh, there's no real evidence of that. Uh, and this was a real tradition in Florida and Georgia and Texas and uh, Alabama to eat turtle eggs. It's very common in the Caribbean and Latin America as well. Um, the first, even though we know Native Americans were utilizing them, because we see it in the middens, uh, you know, remains of these and these products made out of tortoise shells. But uh, as far as the historical record is concerned, really Ponce de Leon is the first one to really write about them. When he came in 1513 in Florida, one of the things he wrote about uh, was the sea turtles. And, and 
what way he described them, we know now that they were, he was talking about green sea turtles. Uh, he landed near where uh, NASA is today. Um, that is still today, that is the highest area in Florida for green sea turtles uh, and other sea turtles. Um, that National Seashore, Cape Canaveral National Seashore gets about 20,000 sea turtle nests every year. And that's, that's even after all the the endangered, you know, the numbers going down. Can you imagine what the numbers would have been in the 1500s, you know, hundreds of thousands, maybe. You know, he was only there for a few days, but he captured, he and his men captured 170 green sea turtles and loaded up on the ships. Um, John Hawkins, who uh, sailed for Queen Elizabeth, he was a slave trader, he, he was an explorer. He talks about, he describes eating green sea turtles. He describes it uh, as the best meat he's ever had. He described it like veal. Um, the sea turtles, it, this became a regular thing for Spanish explorers, for English explorers, French explorers, Portuguese. You would, uh, when you got to the new world, uh, first off, you need a ballast. And that's, uh, the, uh, you know, these ships, you know, a lot of it's in the water. To keep it from flipping over, you, you want some weight on the bottom, what's called ballast. Sometimes there would be rocks, uh, sometimes it would be whatever you're shipping, but sea turtles were often used as ballast. So you would capture on the New World, you usually capture a lot of sea turtles. They're heavy, put them in the bottom of the ship. They'll last for a while. They're alive. So the meat doesn't go rotten until you're ready to eat them. You know, so you keep them alive um, and then you eat them. You know, and you, you know, if you got 50 sea turtles, that's going to feed the men for a long time. Uh, so this is regular practice. Um, there's a funny story that in England, I have another, I, I'll, I'll use this image. There's a, a funny story that in, in England, and this goes all pretty late. I mean, I think, you know, close to the time of Darwin, you know, they had some skeletons of, of these turtles, they had shells, but none of the biologists or, or early naturalists had ever actually seen one of these sea turtles in England. You know, they, and they kept saying to these guys, Next time you go to a new world, bring back one of these sea turtles. Okay. Uh, and apparently they never made it back for years because the men, and they talk about this in letters and stuff, they could not eat it. They were just like almost addicted to the meat. So there was more than once, there were ships that said, we will bring back one of these turtles. And then they get back and they're, ah, well, we ate it. We, we couldn't resist it. We ate it. <laughs> so I, I've never eaten one of these. I, I have had family members that before it was illegal, they've had it. Um, even my professor, my environmental history professor, ate apparently ate a sea turtle in another country, and they all say it was amazing. I, I couldn't do it. I, I, I be honest, I couldn't do it. But apparently, the meat is supposed to be incredible, um, especially getting green sea turtle meat. Um, in the South, including Florida, I mean, the, the, this was a regular practice for people. To, I mean, this is what you did. If you lived in, in, a, in the coast, you, you ate sea turtles. It was like you ate manatees. You ate dolphins if they washed up. You know, you, you hunted whales. I mean, this is what you did. Um, so this is before anybody thought about um, sea turtles as being, you know, uh, being in danger or anything like that. I mean, it was fairly easy to capture, especially in the summer. because they, They're crawling up to lay eggs. Uh, they're very slow I mean, they're huge you ever see one they really are amazingly huge i have i have gone tours where i've seen them lay the eggs and you just can't believe how big they are um but they don't move everything you just get a pole and you can flip them over the back that they're too heavy they can't flip back over so you go over and you flip a bunch over at night and you come back during the day with your wagons and load them up um some of the easiest hunting you can do in fact um but by the late 1800s during during the gilded age they're they're was developed uh, an actual industry. And it starts in Texas, uh, the Gulf Coast of Texas around Galveston in that area. Um, basically capturing sea turtles and then slaughtering them and then canning them either as turtle soup or just turtle meat. Um, initially we see you know, the first cannery open in the 1880s. Uh, fairly quickly, there's gonna be up to six canneries at this place. This is just an early advertisement. Um, Again, sea turtle meat was very sought after. It was a highly desirable meat. Uh, by 1892, there were, again, six canneries in Texas alone. Uh, they shipped a lot of their products to places like uh, New York and other big cities, um, even, even other parts of the world. I mean, again, sea turtle soup was a huge, huge thing. This is an advertisement for London. Um, Again, if you were going to a restaurant back then, you would have been excited to see sea turtle on the menu. Even Heinz, 
uh, uh, had sea turtle soup. And again, they're very clear here, genuine sea turtle soup. I know that fake stuff. Um, and even if you go in parts of Florida, I think even in Georgia, you, occasionally you'll still see restaurants called, you know, uh, Sea Turtle Inn or the Sea Turtle Restaurant or the Green Turtle, um, even though they don't serve turtle anymore, but they would have all the way up to about 1978. Uh, they would have been imported by that point, but they could still serve it. Um, obviously, we don't do that anymore, but you can still see the, you know, you can see remnants of a period when they did. But yet, even though in the 1890s, we have six canneries, uh, by the end of the 1890s, they're gone. They're already overfished. Um, I think the peak year was 1891-ish. You know, they talk about, you know, capturing 100,000 pounds of turtle meat, and then by 1895, it's like 20,000. I think by the 1899, it's gone. They, they literally have overfished it. Now, in this part of Texas, uh, the sea turtles did not, we're talking green turtles here, they did not lay eggs. Uh, they, they just came and ate. Uh, but Florida is also where they actually laid their eggs. And so that became the new focus. Florida became, in particular, Key West. Not only could you capture them in that area, but you can also import them from other parts of Latin America and the Caribbean area. And these are 20th century uh, products, you know, get key, you know, clear green Key West turtle soup. Here's real turtle soup with brandy. And they make sure you know it's a sea turtle. That's what's on the bowl there. Uh, as some of you may know, you can also take the shells and make all kinds of products with it. You can still go to antique shops sometimes and buy real, you know, tortoise shell uh, glasses and, and, and jewelry and such. These are all made from sea turtles here. Even makeup uh, used uh, turtle pro sea turtle products. It apparently it was amazing in makeup. But like I said, it had shifted to Florida, especially to Key West. Uh, you can see hundreds of images. And again, they're just flipping them on their back so they can't get away. Uh, this is a very common thing. People bring them in, you load them up, you might put them in what's known as crawls, which are turtle traps or turtle cages until you're ready to slaughter them. By the 1920s, even though Florida had all these sea turtles, by the 1920s, most of the sea turtle meat being sold in the United States was imported. And Key West becomes the center of that. But again, by the 1920s, again, they've already outfished, you know, there's not, there's not enough to use for the industry. They're having to bring the turtle meat in. So you can see how fast they're, um, they're running out. By, you know, once you get to the era of Silent Spring, you know, the era we just got to talking about, there was beginning to be a change in attitude. People still wanted to see sea turtles and hunt them, but hunt them often for photographs now. People are still eating them, but there was beginning to be an attitudinal change by the 60s and 70s. Um, again, this is just something I have to notice in the Miami Herald, 1966. Why isn't there a law passed to protect a green turtle in Florida? And it says, well, actually, there is one. Um, you know, here, you know, by, there was a hunting season, but then later they, they, they even cut the season out and they actually said, you can't hunt them at all. So there actually was um, already in Florida and other areas a, a, a attempts to, to preserve it. I mean, going back to the 1930s, they, were, they still had hunting seasons, but they were very strict on them. This is again that pre silent spring era of laws. Here's another one. Uh, this is interesting. This is somebody who doesn't like the fact that there's hunting season restrictions. And he says, I know they don't lay eggs in July, which they absolutely do. Um, again, uh, many people pushing for more protections of sea turtles. And again, and, and all of this is coming about because they, people are noticing those numbers are going down, how quickly those numbers went down. But yeah, most people didn't know much about sea turtles until uh, a, a Florida scientist named Archie Carr, who was the world expert on turtles, especially sea turtles. And he wasn't just in North America too. He, you know, he did a lot of his work in Costa Rica, a lot of his work in the Caribbean area. Um, but he mostly focuses his life's work on studying sea turtles, green sea turtles, loggerheads. Uh, he wrote a book called The Windward Road, which it's not only about the vanishing sea turtle populations in the Caribbean, but also Caribbean culture itself. It was a huge seller. And it kind of single-handedly um, sort of internationalized. You know, Florida, you know, at the Florida level, there was interest in sea turtles. Suddenly this becomes a, a national, even international focus. That book directly led to something known as the Sea Turtle Conservancy, which is still around today, an agency to, 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 to organization to protect sea turtles. He's written other books as well. This is a quote, so excellent a fish. This is actually a quote from, from early explorers. Obviously it's not really a fish. Um, but one of the things Archie Carr 
did through his writings, and he wrote for National Geographic, he did documentaries, uh, was something known as Operation Green Sea Turtle, uh, which, which was a program done through the US Navy. They used an old World War II plane. Um, and the idea what they were trying to do was take eggs and hatchlings from other parts like Costa Rica and bring them to parts of the Caribbean and even parts of Florida. Because the idea was we will bury the eggs here, they will hatch here, go off, and then those, then when they're adults, they will come back here. So the idea was try to restore the populations of the Caribbean and parts of Florida. Um, it never really worked. It was a it was a nice idea, but it never actually worked. You know, over a hundred thousands of these were moved, um, but it ultimately failed. Uh, none of these were a lot of them hatch. They, they did track them. The turtles never came back to this area. Um, and ultimately, the Vietnam War, you know, because there was a lot of U.S. U.S. Navy equipment, they said we can't spare this. Anymore. We got a war we're fighting. We can't worry about sea turtles, and it and it died. Um, as I said the other day in class, I'll repeat it slightly. There, there's been a lot of these efforts to try to save the sea turtles, you know, by taking the the eggs, putting them in the laboratory, hatching them there, then bringing them to the beach. That was a very popular thing to do. Uh, it rarely worked. Often they die, they drown. They didn't know how to swim. Uh, sometimes they would put them in tanks so they'd learn how to swim and they'd swim themselves to death. Um, and ultimately, the thought is, and people, when I was a park ranger in the 90s, people still ask, are you guys releasing the sea turtles? And, you know, they quit doing this in the early 80s. Uh, they very quickly realized this doesn't work. Um, it's good for PR, but that's about all it's good for. Um, this is from an article uh, that said, you know, uh, helping sea turtles, you know, lay eggs. And, you know, in other words, this idea of we humans feel this need that we have to help nature when reality, one of the best things you can do is not do much at all. Um, oh, I was going to say was, um, I mentioned earlier that that sea turtle was um, often used in makeup. Uh, this is an ad for Polly Bergen's makeup uh, uh, line in 1968. And there was a, and she very much talked about, look, I use sea turtle oil, sea turtles. There was a huge outcry over this makeup. And she actually had to discontinue the line. So by the late 60s, there was, a, again, a real change of people not wanting to participate in a lot of this anymore. So, you know, um, sea turtles were part of the 1973 Endangered Species Act. So there was already a, an effort to protect them. Florida was already protecting them. So you weren't allowed to hunt them anymore in Florida. Now you can hunt them anywhere. Um, you can no longer eat native sea turtles and you couldn't make products from native sea turtles. But in 1978, uh, their US banned any imports of sea turtles completely and even strengthened a lot of these rules. So 78 is really the last year where Americans could eat. And even that was rare. Um, but, but after that point, you were not gonna be eating sea turtles in America. And if you are, you, you, you're in trouble. Um, Father Archie Carr he passed away in the 80s, but the there's a national refuge. This is near Cape Canaveral, and it is one of the best places to see sea turtles. If you ever want to see sea turtle lay eggs, they do tours in the summer. I do recommend it. I think the last big fight over sea turtles uh, was in the 90s. Uh, I, and I, I come from a family that shrimp, and the, I can tell you they caught a lot of sea turtles. So, uh, and that was a real problem. So they did make them put in TEDs, TEDs. Uh, turtle exclusionary devices, sometimes known as turtle excluder devices. And it's a way for a trap door for the turtles to get out. And it does work, uh, but it also affects shrimping. Uh, as you can see, the sign is at the Florida Capitol in Tallahassee. Somebody says, this is what, you know, and it is true. The, the shrimping did take a hit, but um, at the same time, and this, by the way, my own family, this split the family for a little bit because some of us voted for Ted's, others voted against Ted's. Um, real quick. Um, Kind of like with alligators, uh, there's always been a debate um, when you talk about sea turtles. You know, again, you have several types of sea turtles. Some are very rare. Uh, green sea turtles have never been as rare as, say, loggerheads or Kemp Ridleys or leatherbacks. Uh, the east coast of Florida, they were very much endangered. The Pacific coast of Mexico, they were endangered. But most of the other populations uh, in, the, in South Florida and the Caribbean were maybe threatened, but not absolutely endangered. Um, and there is, you know, people used to farm them. You know, we keep them in what's known as crawls. That's what you see in the image here. Uh, and farm them like you might shrimp or tilapia or catfish. Um, and the idea is you, you're not capturing wild green sea turtles, you're 
you're raising them, farm raising them and still serving them and people can still make money. And even Archie Carr for a while thought this might be a good way, a good balance. And again, this is something that's going to come up a lot. I, and I don't know, I, I've already done getting behind this, but, but there has still been a lot of debate. Yeah, there's an interesting study uh, that came out recently that said, you know, really um, emotion may have played too strong of a role in this. And that's something that, that is always going to be the case. And this is my political science side here is, uh, you know, and when every time you have these environmental laws, you're always, you can't completely do the NOAA principle and save everything. That's just not realistic. Uh, but you can't favor jobs and, and short-term goals either. You have to find a balance. And some people thought maybe farming green sea turtles might have been a way to maintain that balance. But I just want to bring that up because it is, it is still debated in environmental circles that particular way. As, as I said earlier, um, since the 1990s, and this still happens today, the best policy people do with sea turtles, as far as protecting them, is hands off. Collect data, mark the nest, leave them alone, monitor them. Maybe if the nest never hatched, you dig them up to count the eggs, because at that point they're gone. But generally speaking, uh, the lightest touch we can do does seem to be what the best environmental policy uh, with sea turtles. And of course, in Georgia, Georgia does pretty much pretty good job trying to protect sea turtles. There's a pretty cool Georgia Sea Turtle Center in St. Simons, oh, excuse me, Jekyll Island. And I do recommend if you ever get a chance to go check it out. All right, there you go, Endangered Species Act. Um, and uh, stay tuned for later for the um, lecture on, a short lecture on exotics. Thank you, guys.